Hi, I'm James O'Keefe from the, from the Massachusetts Pirate Party. Um, I'm here, out here to show my support for uh, Aaron Schwartz and all those who have been unfairly persecuted by the uh, CFAA and uh, the Department of Justice. And uh, your website again? Like oh, your... our website is masspirates.org. Uh, we've got our convention coming up in June. Uh, stay tuned for that. And, uh, you know, our website and our Twitter feed and Facebook are all there to keep you up to date on all the crap that's going on that uh, the federal, state, and local are trying to do in order to take away our privacy and uh, to prevent us from sharing our culture and innovating as best we feel we can. Awesome. And also to take away your privacy, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what do, you, uh, what do you hope to see happen today from this uh, Arab Sports Rally? Um, I want to see a whole, whole bunch of people who are out here um, saying that they're not going to take the shit anymore from what we're seeing with our government uh, in terms of persecuting people who are merely um, sharing culture or uh, I want this law to go away. The day before he had to decide whether to take Steve Hyman's final plea bargain, he also had to get a colonoscopy at the hospital and so was under general anesthesia. And you know, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're under general anesthesia and can't think straight. You still have to decide whether to take a plea bargain that's going to define the rest of your life for you. Um, I was in that courthouse with him, the courthouse that we're going to march to. Today I was in it in December. It was a key hearing um, that was going to decide, help start the process of deciding which evidence would be admitted in trial against Aaron. And I stood there with him as we came out of the courthouse and I tried to give him a hug. And he said no. Uh, he pushed me away. It was the only time I can ever remember him refusing affection from me. And it was because Steve Hyman was standing there and he said, I don't want to show that to Steve Hyman. I don't want to be vulnerable in front of Steve Hyman. And I was also there a minute later when Steve Hyman came over and handed a manila envelope to Aaron's lawyer and said, hey, I thought you might want to see this. And it turned out that in that manila envelope was exculpatory evidence that Hyman should have turned over a year ago, a year before that, and then has since lied to um, Congress about, when, to the Department of Justice about when he turned it over. Um, he waited until after it was clear the evidence was going to be discovered anyway. And that kind of thing happens all the time. Like all of these things happen all of the time. And very few people ever find out about the exculpatory evidence that's hidden from them. When you take a plea bargain, you give up the right to see the evidence against you. You give up the right to appeal. Right? We have a system that's designed we think, we think we live in a system that's like what you see on Law and Order, where you have constitutional rights and you have lawyers who fight for your constitutional rights and then you go to a jury, jury before your peers. And that happens to almost no one. The vast majority of people in our system need public defendants because they can't afford lawyers. Public defendants get half the resources of prosecutors. You're forced, you're, you're, your lawyers tell you to take a plea, plea deal because if you don't, you're being charged with something like 10 times as much as they're offering in the plea deal and you feel that you have no choice. That's what happened to Aaron and Aaron is one of the few people who chose to fight and that infuriated the prosecutors. They didn't know how to handle it. Nobody ever fights. Um. So the problem is the nature of federal criminal statutes and starting about the mid-1980s, I know I started practicing in 1967, starting about the mid-1980s, I noticed prosecutions, people would come to me and say, I've just been indicted, I've threatened with indictment, I'd say, well, what did you do? They'd tell me what they did, and I'd say, you mean that's criminal? They'd say to me, you're the lawyer. And I couldn't see it. If I can't understand the line between what's criminal and not, then few people are going to be able to understand it. So we started the era of runaway federal prosecutorial discretion. I actually took several years to write a book about the problem, it came out in 2009, called Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. Title three felonies a day was a slightly ironic, but not really much of an exaggeration. The notion was that the average law-abiding citizen goes about his or her day 
and unwittingly and unknowingly commits at least three arguable federal felonies. And I can assure you, if I sat down with any one of you and we went over your day yesterday, I can pick out three things you've done that could make you a target. Now, of course, the whole group isn't going to be indicted, but you're vulnerable. And all you have to do is come to their attention and they can get you. That's the system that has to be changed. Um, in, the, in three felonies a day, uh, the filmmaker, the documentary filmmaker and author Errol Morris did a book blurb, and the book blurb is actually quite eloquent. He uh, begged society, generally, and readers of my book in particular, to pay attention, he said, it was urgent, pay attention. Well, of course, few people paid attention, and now we have Aaron's tragedy. Finally, I sense people are beginning to pay attention, legislators are beginning to pay attention. I had the uh, occasion a couple of years ago to testify on behalf of some libertarian, liberal, and conservative groups, real coalition to try to stop a cyber bullying, criminal cyber bullying statute that Congress was thinking of passing. And I got up and I figured out a real strategy for beating back this piece of legislation, pointed out to them that I make my living by cyber bullying. That is, people are trying to do bad things to my clients and even to me, and I get on the phone or I get an email, and what do I do? I try to bully them out of doing the harm that they're planning. I also pointed out that Congress couldn't function without cyberbullying, because if they couldn't be quite nasty to the people that they're dealing with, including their colleagues, they weren't going to get anywhere. Well, needless to say, the bill died. It died before it ever got out of the womb, and it died because they recognized that they were about to pass a statute that was going to be dangerous for them. They were now suddenly at the mercy, Congress, at the mercy of FBI agents and Department of Justice prosecutors. They weren't going to let that happen. But you see, they have been unable to generalize and to see how much of the legislation that they do pass is in this category. Um, I, uh, so there's really a war, it's not just a war against the uh, errands of the world. It's a war against accountants, scientists, people who manufacture pharmaceuticals, artists, uh, politicians, state and local police, newspaper reporters, lawyers, students. I've got chapters in my book on all of these groups that have been harassed by federal prosecutors. And it's also a war against the young, and particularly young, smart kids. It was a few decades ago that they, that they decimated a whole generation of young kids who had not been to college, who were not that smart. Now they're picking on the rest. They have no limits, uh, and they have no principles except their own uh, power. Um, I did have an experience uh, similar to uh, what you were talking about. Back in the 70s, I represented a couple of uh, MIT students who had likewise figured out how to make free long-distance phone calls. They had developed a, a little gadget that mimicked the touch tones of the uh, then new touch tone phone system. Uh, I was brought up on rotary dials, but I did finally figure out how to use touch tone phone. Uh, and, um, they had made some uh, free phone calls to their friends in Iceland and Guam and all over the world. They got caught, but they were lucky they were taken to state court, and the state prosecutors recognized, you don't really want to give a criminal record to these kids who are going to be, represent the future of the country. So they made a deal. The charges were dropped, provided the students spent some time lecturing the security people at what was then called the New England Telephone Company, since absorbed in, I don't know which conglomerate it belongs to now. Uh, and they agreed, they lectured the security people to show them how to really keep their system secure. And they had no criminal record. They went on to make contributions to society. That common sense is totally missing in the United States Department of Justice.
Then the feds took over. And that's where we are now, and it's why we're in such trouble. It's Harry Lewis at Harvard, a former dean of the college and now a professor of computer science over there. He actually, on his well, you should read his website. His website lists some of the students of his who, had they been around students today, probably would be in prison rather than uh, major contributors to the progress of our society. Steve Jobs, uh, Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, already mentioned here. Aaron Swartz, I have, I have studied the case. Uh, I can tell you that he committed no crime in my view. And it's a, my view is a fairly sophisticated one legally. You can trust me on that. He committed no crime. I actually think he would have won his case. Uh, but his life was ruined and ended by a, an unjust, uh, very ill-considered prosecution, totally abusive. Carmen Ortiz is not the first U.S. attorney to do this. She's not the last. She just happened to be around when their strategy ended in a disaster. But in order to not have more Carmen Ortiz's in the future and Steve Hyman's in the future, we've got to make major changes. And it can't only be in the cyber law area. It has to be across the board in federal criminal uh, statutes. Um, had Aaron, of course, been treated my, like my two uh, MIT students in the 70s, we wouldn't be here. But again, this battle is beyond the CFAA, but I have to say that the CFAA is a good place to start, but it's not a good place to finish. Thank you very much. Their view in this space, at least, is nothing like what a normal human being. And, and we don't just, you know, we, we select these prosecutors in our system we don't select them for their capacity for justice. We don't reward them if they show mercy. We judge them based on their conviction rate. That's the only thing that anybody cares about. And then we elect them to higher office so that they can write laws to help other prosecutors, to give other prosecutors more power. And we give them almost limitless power. Um, over the last couple decades, one of the things that's happened in our criminal justice system is a shift of power from judges to prosecutors so that prosecutors now play a very like a, a, a key role in the sentencing process not judges um, and prosecutors under laws like the CFAA which as David said some people in Congress are actually trying to make worse believe it or not are so ambiguous those laws are so ambiguous that prosecutors can do almost anything they want to almost anybody they want um, we have to rein in prosecutorial power and we have to fix laws like the CFAA. And most, <laughs> and for the most important thing is we need fundamental. Hey. Oh, oh. Carmen Ortiz has got to go. Hey, hey. Oh, oh. Carmen Ortiz has got to go. Hey, hey. Oh, oh. Carmen Ortiz has got to go. Hey, hey. Oh, oh. Carmen Ortiz has got to go. Hey, oh, oh. helped start the process of deciding which evidence would be admitted in trial against Aaron. And I stood there with him as we came out of the courthouse and I tried to give him a hug. And he said no. Uh, he pushed me away. It was the only time I can ever remember him refusing affection from me. And it was because Steve Hyman was standing there and he said, I don't want to show that to Steve Hyman. I don't want to be vulnerable in front of Steve Hyman. And I was also there a minute later when Steve Hyman came over and handed a manila envelope to Aaron's lawyer and said, hey, I thought you might want to see this. And it turned out that in that manila envelope was exculpatory evidence that Hyman should have turned over a year ago, a year before that, and then has since lied to um, Congress about when, to the Department of Justice about when he turned it over. Um, he waited until after it was clear the evidence was going to be discovered anyway. And that kind of thing happens all the time. Like all of these things happen all of the time. 
and very few people ever find out about the exculpatory evidence that's hidden from them. When you take a plea bargain, you give up the right to see the evidence against you. You give up the right to appeal. Right? We have a system that's designed, we think, we think we live in a system that's like what you see on Law and Order, where you have constitutional rights and you have lawyers who fight for your constitutional rights and then you go to a jury, jury before your peers. And that happens to almost no one. The vast majority of people in our system need public defendants because they can't afford lawyers. Public defendants get half the resources of prosecutors. You're forced, you're, you're, your lawyers tell you to take a plea, plea deal because if you don't, you're being charged with something like 10 times as much as they're offering in the plea deal and you feel that you have no choice. That's what happened to Aaron and Aaron is one of the few people who chose to fight and that infuriated the prosecutors. They didn't know how to handle it. Nobody ever fights. Um, and then criminal justice reform. We had just have to have it in this country, and we're not going to go away until we have it. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. My name is Brett Ryan, and I'm running as a write-in candidate for U.S. Senate, for Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate for Massachusetts. Um, I think this is a great event today here. Uh, I think this is a wonderfully symbolic of what's happening on the site of Occupy Boston, because very much it's, it's very much the same struggle. You know, the um, uh, the, the global uh, corporate security state is only interested in controlling information because it's information that's the tool by which the people can get justice. Economic justice, social justice, legal justice. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today and um, I'm very pleased to see that they've gotten a good turnout today and I, I, wish, I wish the organizers of this event um, very well. Thanks. What do you hope to see happen from this event today? Well, you know, I think that um, social movements um, move slowly, uh, but the important thing is that they happen, and that an event like this will, uh, its effect will be multiplied uh, many, many times uh, online. That's the beauty of, of, of the internet, right? I mean, this is, you know, the, 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 way, the way this event, you know, symbolizes so many things is, is just terrific, right? So, so we have this... Uh, we have this event that, that commemorates um, uh, someone who fell in the struggle for information freedom, right? And the, uh, the, the event itself is being documented, and that documentation will then go out online and help spread the word. So I think that, you know, it's important to have these, these physical events because they're the seeds by which the movement grows. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me get your, uh, my homemade, uh, my homemade tech. Oh, here. Oh, dude, check this out. Here, put this up online, and people can put their phone up to the QR code. How about that? Awesome. Why did you decide to come down today? Uh, well, I've been heavily involved in the Op Angel um, movement here in Boston. We're at the courthouse every other week actually protesting Carmen Ortiz. Outside the courthouse? Did you go to her house too, her neighborhood? Uh, I know no some comment? of might have uh, been involved in that, but uh, I can't really say whether or not that would be, but I, uh, I'm well aware of, uh, of all that, those shenanigans, and you know, we're keeping the pressure on her, and we're making sure that she knows that Boston isn't happy, Massachusetts isn't happy with you know, the work that she's doing, so trying to get her fired and trying to get the CFAA reformed, and came out here to show support for that. Awesome. Yeah. So what do you, you want to see the, uh, the reform? That's why you're here today? Yep. Awesome, thank you.